<laughs> oh, thank you, God. You're so good. <laughs> thank you, God, because he who knew no sin, he who knew no sin became sin, that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It feels so good to not have to try to measure up. It feels so good to not have to try to perform to be good enough, but just to receive and say thank you. Ooh, and that's when I start to get excited, is it's like, he's so good. <laughs> Come on, he's so good. Jesus. Like, I'm so glad I'll never be seen for my past mistakes and failures. I'm so glad that he doesn't hold a record against me. I'm so glad that there is no more condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Like, it's so fun to live life with no secrets and no closets. It feels so good. It feels so good to be clean. Thank you, Jesus. And it's not because I tried hard. It's because of the Lamb of God that was slain. Thank you, Lord. And that's all of us. We just have to receive and say thank you. But I do think there's just something about pushing past the feelings of not feeling worthy, not feeling good enough. There's something about... I don't think the enemy likes it when we get excited about what he's done, but we need to. We need to get excited. And it's okay to shout. It's okay to raise your voice. It's okay to be happy that you're accepted. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. I just feel like we're supposed to go back into that one more time. I know we've, it's kind of an extended worship, but I just feel like there's things he just wants to wash away. Maybe things you've held on to, but as you just raise your voice, don't worry about what the person next to you thinks. Maybe you've never lifted up a shout to him. I remember the first time in college being in my car and shouting the name of Jesus, I was by myself at that point, but I shouted the name of Jesus at the top of my lungs and it was so invigorating, it was so powerful and it, it changes things, guys. Like there's a reason that the Psalms say to lift up a shout of praise. It's more than emotions, it's more than just, but it's crazy because sometimes there's a lot of emotions with it and that's okay. But it's you pushing through the emotion. So we'll just go back into that and really just thank him. Really just think about what he's done. And maybe there is something trying to just keep a hold on you. Just let it go in your praise and in your worship to him. Thank you, Jesus. I cannot explain. I cannot explain. But nothing's more real than this In the presence of God Oh, what my heart experienced When my shame hit the wayside What's happening right now? My sin met the most high I was washed from the inside I was washed from the inside I know it was the blood, could have only been the blood. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it was the blood, could have only been the blood. There's some shame hitting the wayside this morning. Some sin that's about to meet the most high and it's about to die. Yeah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it was the blood, could have only been the blood. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it was
just lift up a shout of praise for Jesus. Jesus! Praise you, God! Thank you, God! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. You, Glory to God. Hallelujah. God. Praise Jesus. Amen. Well, one more shout. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Glory to God. You may be seated. Um, I'm going to try to share something that I've been struggling to find words for, and then I'm going to get into the message, and we don't know how far into it I will get today, but how many of you know there doesn't have to be something wrong between you and God? Let me say that again. There doesn't have to be something wrong between you and God. How many of you sometimes, and you don't have to raise a hand or any of that stuff, but because like today when we were doing that last song again and Gabriel was exhorting, um, sometimes, more often than we realize, the enemy is the one who's trying to tell people what's wrong between you and God. In other words, he's a liar. Thanks, Gabe, that's a good word. He's the accuser of the brethren. He will accuse you of stuff that you haven't even done. He will try to tell you that it just can't quite be okay. And that's a lie. Because the blood of Jesus was more than enough. You guys? So if you get that little nagging thing like off to the side, yeah, but can I really be okay with God? There's got to be something wrong. No, there doesn't. And sometimes the biggest thing to take down is that lie that tells you there has to be something that's wrong. And then there's freedom in that. Did my children do everything right growing up? Nope. (laughs) The other ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the other four. They didn't, but never did my love for them change. Never did I not want to be with them. Never. Never. There wasn't one time that I never wanted to be with my children. There was never one time I said, I'm so sick of you. I can't stand your face anymore. Never. Nothing like that ever ran through my heart. And think about our Heavenly Father. He did everything He could when we were still yet sinners to have us back, to be back in His presence. Amen? So let's, my heart, part of my heart is that we learn to live knowing that, you know what? It's good with me and my Father. It's good. It's good. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Just turn and look at someone and say, yeah, it's good. It's good with me and my Father. Yeah, we've all blown. We've all messed up. We've all sinned. But the blood of Jesus and what he did on that cross for for us took care of all of that stuff. Amen? Amen? Father God, today as we continue on and we look at things and we start talking about what you've put in my heart, Uh, for the future. I just ask that you give me a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and an awareness, an utterance to share and speak what you want, shared and spoken. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me dig my stuff out here. Glory to God. Amen. 
title today would be this, Things to Come. Things to Come. How many of you know there's things to come? There's things that God has put in place. There's things that he is setting up, and there's, there's things to come, and he's giving us time to prepare. Amen. He's giving us time to prepare. You know, like um, radical things. And we got to keep our hearts right, guys. We really do. Because this whole business of turning little boys into little girls and little girls into little boys, it's totally wrong. It's totally against the will of God. And there's going to be young people that through medical practices got changed from how God designed them to how he didn't. And they're going to come to a relationship of Christ and they're going to want, oh, God, I'm so sorry. And, and Joe was sharing this with me. The first time she started coming to this church, God put it in her heart to start believing God for miracles and for young people to be put back and for body parts to be put back. And our God is big enough. Amen. Amen. And here's where we have to keep our heart right. We could get really judgmental. We could, we could get really full of condemnation and we could get really full of superiority. But we can't afford to go there. I can't afford to let that get on the inside of me. Because just like you, I had my sin. I'd take another amen on that, please. Because we all did. Maybe just not in the way that other people did. But you know what? We were all in darkness at one point. We didn't know any better. So keep our hearts right and believe in God for the miraculous. There's some stuff that he wants to do, and he's, he's preparing us. I want to read something I wrote. I find that stuff gets stirring on the inside of me, and then if I go write it down, I can reread it. Sometimes it has a prophetic element to it, um, and this does. There's coming a move of God in our day. Yes! <laughs> In our day. Someone say our day. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, you know, Carol Lee, when you talked about the time, what a privilege it is to be alive at this point in time. To get to be on the face of the earth and get to be a child of God and get to be used by him in amazing ways. There is coming a move of God in our day. The core of this movement will be for the lost who have not yet come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. It will be similar to previous moves of God. There will be what look like several waves, moves of the Spirit at the same time. There will be healings like the healing revivals. There will be gifts and manifestation of the Spirit like the charismatic movement. And there will be a feel and a flavor of the Jesus movement. But the core, the heart of this move will be for the lost to come to Jesus. The grace and strength of our Father and God will be there to work through us. We will need to step out in faith and then the grace will kick in. There will be much to do. But the joy and the excitement will bring great strength and energy. People will be so grateful on both sides, meaning those who come into relationship with Jesus and those who step out in faith and share with them. The joy and the fullness of God, oh yes. There will be much rejoicing, there will be much joy, and a great celebration. Amen? Amen? That's... That's in our future. That's for us. Amen. And, and God has put some things in my heart. I've mentioned it a few times through prayer. You know, a place that I got about some things, you know, in the future. And springtime keeps coming up, keeps showing up. I don't know why. I, I don't know why. Do you know why to everything? No, you don't. I don't know why. It's just what's in my heart. 
And I think it has to do with this. There's people's hearts that are going to be ready and prepared. Things are going to thaw out inside of people. And God is it working. He is working. So today you're going to get a few stories. You're going to get some scripture. You're going to get a video. You're going to get a number of things. But I want us to be praying between now, starting now, and into the future, praying with an expectation. And I will talk about that expectation some today and some in the days to come. I'll do my level best to explain it so that it's made really clear. But not just pray, but pray with an expectation. And part of in that expectation is, God, I expect to be involved. God, I expect for you to talk to me. I expect to be used. I expect to be one who is sent across the path of somebody else to bring the goodness and the love of you. And, and pray with that expectation and then also be praying with an already determined, yes, I will go. Yes, I will obey. Yes, I will step out. Yes, I will open my mouth and I will share with that perfect stranger. Amen? Yes. And yes, I'll share with my neighbor when he gives me something for my neighbor. Amen? Because part of what God is doing, God is preparing people for harvest. God is preparing people for Jesus. And he does that. He does that. He was working on your behalf before you even knew him. The evidence is Jesus dying on a cross. But then it gets more detailed and it gets more personal. Story. I was working up on the mountain, and many of you have heard this before, but it's a good story. In fact, my dear friend Bob over there, I think it's one of his favorites. (laughs) I think he knows where I'm going already, too. But we're, I'm up working on the mountain. For those of you that don't know, I grew up at Crazy Horse Mountain, um, worked up there till I was 21, and God had something bigger for me to do. So um, I never told my mom that he had something bigger for me to do, but ha. Huh. Anyway, <clears throat> we're working, and there's a hillside here. It, all this rock is in front of the horse's head. And we're just, there's massive amount. It's probably from the horse's head out 200 feet, maybe 150 feet. And we got to bring it down 150 feet. And then it's about 160 foot wide. So there's a lot of rock that just has to go in its mountain. But we've been blasting and blasting and blasting. And, and there's a road here like this. And then there's a wall that's pretty good angled wall that goes up maybe 60, 75 feet. And we just had blasted, and now Dad's using the bulldozer, the D9, and he's plowing down the road, pushing the rock up the side, plowing down the road, and every time he goes back and forth, the D9's pretty big, he notices this rock wall here is shifting. It's, it's moving. And he knows enough to know it's going to come down, and if he keeps working on it with the bulldozer, it's going to come down on him. Now, well, I think about my dad. He knows it's going to come down, so he says to my brother Adam, my brother Casimir, and myself, take your pry bars, and it's a metal bar about an inch round, four or five foot long, take your bars, climb up there, and pry them boulders down. And he knows it's going to come down. Let's get the bulldozer out of the way and protect it. You boys go up there. (laughs) True story. So we climb up there. I'm standing here, and my brother Adam is over there about six or eight feet, and Casimir's feet are up higher because he's higher up on the hill, uh, uh, and, and his feet are about level with my head. And I take my bar and put it in between two rocks to start to pry. And the next thing I know, I'm standing down on the road, and we climbed up about 35 feet. I'm standing down on the road surrounded by boulders and I got my bar in my hand and I can literally reach and pat a boulder this high one right there one right there and one right over here three of them and I got my bar and I'm standing there 
And I turn and I look, and Adam is back there about 15 feet, sitting on the ground with his bar in his hand. Casimir, what he was standing on, never let go. And the way my dad was, you didn't stop and talk about it. You didn't go, oh my, wow, isn't that awesome? You just went right to work. Had we talked about it, he would have chewed me and Adam out for standing on the wrong rocks. Don't stand on the ones that are going to fall. Okay, Dad. Yeah, anyway, so we go right back to work. About two weeks later or so, my brother Casimir goes, hey, you remember that day? And I'm like, yeah. And I shared with him what I just shared with you about being down on the ground. But blacking out. I don't remember how I got from up here on the hillside down to there. I have no recollection. And Casimir goes, this is what I saw. He said, you skipped from one rolling boulder to the next, to the next, and then you hopped to the ground. You had no clue how skilled I was, did you? <laughs> I got skills. But here's the deal. I don't remember it. You know what God had to do? Turn me off. That's what, I would have messed it up. I would, have, I would have missed that second boulder. I'd have messed it up. I don't remember any of it. Okay, years go by. I'm, I'm 18 years old about when that happens. Years go by. I'm not saved. And years go by. And now here's the more important part of the story. I get born again, I get saved, I get filled with the Holy Spirit. I go down to Rama Bible Training Center, get, get my teaching and, you know, ministry and all that stuff. Then I come back, and I end up in Rushville, Nebraska. And I'm pastoring a church there. And there's this dear friends of ours now. We've known them ever since we started going. John and Francis Wickman, you hear me talk about them. Many of you have met them. And they share this story with me. They said, um, Pastor... We were talking to some friends of ours. John and Francis lived 60 miles from the church. And they had friends that lived another 40 miles past them out in the sand hills of Nebraska. And they were telling their friends about their new pastor, me. And in telling them about me, they said where I grew up, Crazy Horse Memorial. And this family got all excited. This husband and wife got all excited. And they said, oh, glory to God. We've been praying for that family for years. Yeah. It wasn't me. It was the prayers of other people praying. Amen? Marty Blackwelder, who was just here, I don't remember the circumstances, but I remember him sharing uh, his testimony one time, and, and he'd gotten born again. And, and it, pretty sweet salvation and then after he had been born again for a while there were some friends that he found out about who had been praying for him for years amen praying with a purpose praying with a purpose praying with expectation how many of you in here have stories where you found out somebody was praying for you or you were praying for somebody and then the, the fruit of that prayer came into existence. You got to see it. You got to experience it. I mean, how cool is that? See, and when I'm talking about prayer, I'm talking about praying for people, praying in the Holy Spirit with an expectation. Because God's preparing people for salvation. Do you know he has to do that sometimes? How many of you have had something like this? I'm jumping ahead of my notes, but that's okay. Um, when I was probably 16 or 17, I was going from the veranda, the back porch, down a set of steps to where they'd keep all the souvenirs. And as I went down those steps, it's like I went through something. And that something just left me with this, with a residue on me. God, you're real. God, you're so real. How many of you have had things similar to that when you were unsaved? 
there was a move, there was something that happened, and it was supernatural, and you maybe can't explain it, but it's like there was this encounter, there was this realization, and, and when I went through that, on the other side, the best way to say it was, you couldn't tell me God wasn't real. It was just, I was hit with the fact that, yeah, God's real. I had always believed in him, but this was just a part of God preparing. Anybody else besides me have stuff like this? Glory to God. Thank you for putting hands up quickly. I appreciate that. Glory to God. Yeah, yeah, no. But, I mean, he's preparing people. He's getting people ready. John Wember. How many of you know John Wember? You've heard of him. I like his story. Before he was saved, two things he had mentioned in his testimony, two things that had happened in his life where it was God preparing him for salvation. One of them was, it's kind of, it's really a depressed, depressed time. I don't know if it was during the depression or not, um, but it was very, very depressed economically. And he's on the street on a Sunday afternoon, I think it was, and he sees this sign over the Salvation Army store, and the sign says, Jesus saves. And he, John Wimber had no understanding of church. He, no understanding of Jesus. And he goes, hmm, I wonder what he saves. Tin foil? Paper clips? Da 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 da. What, what? That was his understanding. But God caught his attention with that sign. And just that little bit, he's preparing people. Later on in his life, he's standing on a street in California underneath an awning. And. Um, this guy comes walking down the street with one of those sandwich board advertisements on, you know, the two ropes, the board in the front, and he's watching this guy come down the street in the rain. And, and on the front of the, the advertisement, it said, I'm a fool for Christ. And then as he walked past, he read the back half, and it said, whose fool are you? Those two things. Getting his heart ready. Do you know God's preparing people right now? He's preparing people right now. He's getting them ready for you. Turn to look at somebody and say, yeah, he's getting them ready for me to bring Jesus. Amen? I don't know about you, but I get excited about that. I get excited thinking about some of this stuff. Okay, go with me, if you would, please, to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And you guys are doing great, right? You're like, come on, pastor, bring it. Share this with us. Because this is for our future, you guys. It's stuff we get to look forward to. Acts chapter 9. Now, what had happened prior to this is there was persecution in the church realm, and the, the, they were scattered, and Philip went down to Samaria, and a revival broke out. Healings, miracles, salvations, uh, uh, demons cast out. I mean, it was an awesome time. It's way cool. And then uh, uh, Peter and John hear about it, and they go down, and they pray for him to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is just a really, <laughs> how many of you have gone, yeah, I think that sounds cool. And it says there was great joy throughout the city. The whole city was impacted by it. It wasn't just a small thing. It, it impacted the whole city. I'm looking forward to whole cities being impacted. Amen. Counties and regions and states. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to the part that you get to play, and I'm looking forward to the part that I get to play. Amen. Turn and look at somebody and say, yep, you got a part. Okay, so 9, verse 26. This is Philip, and he's just had all of this stuff going on that I just mentioned. In verse 26, it says this, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, arise, and go towards the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is, a, this is the desert. Huh? Oh, thank you for catching that. Thank you for helping. Appreciate it. I was moving too fast. Chapter 8. So for those of you that I confused, there's people here to straighten out the things that I confuse. I asked twice in one day. I got a few more to go. All right. 
chapter 8, verse 26. I'll read that again. It'll work better. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert. I love this. So he arose and went. Yes. Amen. How many of us will just say, Okay, God, I will arise and go. You give me instruction. You give me something to do. You tell me. I'll arise and go. And I love that he just, he arose and went. It wasn't a debate. It wasn't, oh, do I need to get this? Do I have to have a second pair of clothes? Do I got a da 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 I mean, he's going down to a desert road. Do I need to get some water? Da, da, da. He arose and went. I just like that. Sometimes it's the simple things. He arose and went. The next two words are awesome. And behold. <laughs> Those are really cool. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch with great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopians, who had ch charge over all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him. And heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? Boy, you talk about a setup. Do you see what I mean when God's preparing? God's preparing things? Think about it, you guys. It's a desert road. Philip, go. Okay. And behold, here's this guy in a chariot. And he just happens to be reading from the book of Isaiah. Praying with expectation. I'm expecting supernatural encounters with people who God is getting ready. You know, you've heard of cold calling? Go knock on a door, a cold call? You know what, guys? We don't have to do cold calling. God will already be preparing Boy, let this sink in, will you please? Because if we let this sink in, it'll take away some of the worry and the fear. God's already preparing people. It's not a cold call. So, hallelujah. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? So he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led by sheep to the he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shears he was silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generations? For his life was taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? <laughs> How hard is that? I mean, it's, it's all put in place for him. How many of us are going to be expecting God to put everything in place? Preparing people's hearts, getting them ready. Amen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you know what I look forward to? I'll just say it now. I look forward to your stories. I look forward to your testimonies. I look forward to standing at the foyer of the door and you come walking in and you go, Pastor, guess what I got to do this week? Guess what happened this week? I got to hear a story similar. It wasn't in the realm of salvation, but Mark was sharing one with me about how God was setting things up and God was taking care of stuff. This, this pray with expectation. Amen. Expect to be used. Expect God to have people prepared. Amen. And then look for it. Look for it. Be looking for it. My brother Mark, he could find arrowheads 
you know, flint arrowheads like nobody's business. We're walking down the road, and he just goes, oh, there's an arrowhead, and he'd pick them up. They'd be this long, you know, they were obviously carved out of flint made by an Indian, and just, he always found them before I did. He was looking for them. He is expecting it. When we pray, pray in faith, expect it. Look for it. Wake up dreaming about it. Do you know God will give you people's face? Yes. Do you know you'll see people in your dreams? Yes. Amen. And you'll wake up the next day and there they are. Amen. Talk about a setup. Yes. Amen? Yes. And, and I think lots of times the, 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 the church as a whole doesn't Expect or look for this. The church will try to do it in their own strength, which is commendable, but a lot harder. And a lot of people get burned out. Man, wouldn't it be cool just to bat 100%? <laughs> and if, I, if I'm doing 50 by, on my way to 100, fine. But I'm learning and I grow. Amen? Okay. Just, just looking for it. This last week, Diana and I came back from uh, uh, Iowa, and we stopped in Rapid City. How many of you know when you go on a, a vacation, you empty out the refrigerator, and then when you come home, there's no food in the house? Well, that's what was going to happen to us, so we stopped at Olive Garden and ate. And then we got one of those $6 meals to take home. And I had more breadsticks than I normally had, and da-da-da-da-da, so I had a lot of leftovers. I did it right. Um, but as I was sitting there, the gal waiting on us, I could just, just sense it, just pick up. Boy, something heavy. Something heavy is on her. She's going through something. Didn't know what, didn't have anything like that, just knew she was going through something. So she came and she would come and go. She was very polite, but she didn't stay here any longer than she had to. And she was gone. Took her order, was gone. Brought her food, was gone. Da, 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 da. So finally at the end, she didn't even give, her, uh, give us her name. And we usually like to know the name of the person waiting on us. So I just said, hey, can you tell me your name? And she shared her name, and that was my opportunity to talk. I said, hey, are you going through something heavy? Is there something weighty going on in your life right now? And, and she hesitated and she didn't want to share necessarily because I think it was a pretty big deal to her. But she just finally went, yeah, I am. And what seemed right was just to say to her, well, tell you what, we got your name now. And my wife and I, we're going to be praying for you. And that was it. And before we left the table, we grabbed hands, just bowed our heads and prayed for her. Looking for it. Just looking for it. Amen? Amen? Being sensitive. Hallelujah. And, and here, I want to put this in. Hannah, I'm getting pretty close. I got a video I want you to play that really talks about what I'm talking about. In fact, you can start putting it up there while I get this verse and just read this verse of Scripture because this is a very important verse of Scripture and there's a truth in this that I want us to catch a hold of. It'll help us a lot. The Apostle Paul says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. See, we, we, and he says, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Here's how this verse of Scripture works. By faith, I ask a question. Are you in the middle of something weighty? I do that by faith. By faith, I take that step. And then the grace of God kicks in. And we get to walk it out, not in our own strength. But it's through his strength. It's through his wisdom to do it. It's really simple. Our part is to take the step. 
Our part is to open up our mouth. Our part is to ask the question. Our part is to be sensitive, to be willing. You know, Philip, and he went. Yeah. Amen. You got that ready, Handa? Hand, Handa. That's not all, folks. No, thank you. And if you'll turn the lights off above the TVs, that helps. Hallelujah. I was walking up to a black car, and I saw a lady there. She looked very angry. So I was like, okay, Lord, I'm not going to go talk to her because she, she might scream at me. So I started to walk the other direction, but in my spirit it said, no, go back. So I turned around, and I walked back to her, and I said, has anyone told you that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? Um, and I told her that, and she was like, no, no one's ever told me that. Um, when we were walking back to the car, the lady in the black truck pulls up, and she pulls up kind of frantically, but when she lets the window down, I can literally see the glory of God on her face. So I'm walking over to this lady's car, and I'm like, okay, Lord, what happened? What I did not know was that this lady had been diagnosed with cancer, and the doctors gave her less than a year to live. Well, that was four years ago. So God had completely touched her body and she was still living, but she was like, Lord, I, I just, there's something going on. I don't know what it is. I need you to tell me that you love me. Tell me that you care for me, that you have a plan for my life still because I'm not seeing it. And she said, the moment you walked up to me and told me that, she said, I was like, Lord, that was what I was asking you for. So let me tell you, when you feel like someone's face does not look right, remember that that is God's child and you need to go tell them that God loves them and that he has a plan for their life. So if you're not soul winning, you need to start today because there's a lost generation that needs God in their life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was Amen. Hallelujah. See, God's setting things up. He's setting things up. Mm. Hallelujah. Uh, Okay, go with me. This is going to be, I think, my last verses. You all ready for one more passage of Scripture this morning? I, I got a point that I want to pull out of this. This one is in Acts chapter 9. I promise you, it's in Acts chapter 9. And, and I would like to read almost the whole chapter. It really won't take me that long, but I'll only read down to verse 18. God's. How many of you know that? God is preparing people for you to come across their path. Would you dream about that a little bit? And would you say, God, here I am, send me? Wake up in the morning, go, oh God, who do I get to connect with today and bring your love and goodness? See, thank God for all of his blessings. Thank God for the goodness that we have and, and his mercy and all of that that overflows and runs out. But how many of you know we, we got a bigger purpose than just be blessed? We got a bigger purpose to take the love and the goodness of God to the people around us. Amen? It's, it's, it's reaching out to people. I love the sign at the end of the driveway. I did not put it up. I did not know who put it up for a long time. But it was our um, Rob, Heather's boyfriend, the yellow sign that says you're about ready to enter the mission field. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, Acts chapter 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him in, of, to go to the synagogue of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed and came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And it is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembled, so he trembled and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who joined with him, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they laid, led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. 
Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. Yeah. For one called Saul of Tarsus. Uh, for one called Saul of Tarsus. Catch this phrase. For behold, he is praying. Friends, there's people out there right now praying who don't know Jesus. They're praying. They're praying and they're asking for help. They're praying and they're asking for guidance. There's people out there praying who don't know Jesus. How many of you prayed before you met Jesus? <laughs> you threw up a prayer? You knew there was somebody that could help you and you threw up a prayer. You weren't even born again, but you threw up a prayer. Am I the only one or there's others? How many of us? There's a bunch of us in here. We did that. We were out there praying. We were hungry. We were, God, I need help. We, we didn't know to say God. We didn't know a lot of things, but I need help. We were praying. You know what? They're still out there. There's people still out there. They're praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And I hear he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And I will show him how much things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way. I had to highlight that. And Ananias went his way. And entering the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road... As you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell something from his eyes uh, like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when I say that God is setting people up, that God's preparing people, he is. Amen? He is. Now, how many of you, if you were Ananias, you might have had a yeah, but moment? Because you've heard about Saul. How cool was that for Ananias? Because he got baptized, and then you know what Saul started doing? Preaching. How cool was that for Ananias to watch? And you know that he got to watch and be aware of Paul's ministry into the future. How glad was he that he obeyed what looked like a stupid idea? But Paul was praying. He sincerely wanted to know. Guys, God's getting ready. He's getting people ready for us. And there's going to be some stuff break loose in the spring. Why this, Does that mean that nothing can happen between now and then? No, certainly not. But get ready. And see, he's wanting us to prepare ourselves. We're going to be busy. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead. I want to thank you guys for uh, staying with me. Let's all go ahead and stand up. Amen. For those of you that are here this morning visiting, um, yeah. yep, please do, Gabe. Um, so just a, a quick testimony to really uh, just put the exclamation point, I guess, on what he's talking about. Um, and I haven't told a lot of people this story, actually, but we were in Nicaragua on our mission trip and we went out to eat. It was our, uh, we call it a fun day. It's just like we go out and show the team the sights. And we had gone up on this uh, little town that looks out over a volcanic lake. It's beautiful. And we were eating, we went to eat lunch. And as we were eating lunch, it started to rain outside. And up on this, the, the, at this little town, there's a lot of people that come in 
uh, to the town to sell things to the tourists. And so you have guys selling necklaces, watches, all sorts of things, little whistles. Bad idea for the kids. It's very nice <laughs> for the adults, I should say. But anyway, uh, so we're, we're there, and we go to eat lunch. We're eating lunch. It starts to rain, and then some of these vendors come in from outside because it's raining. And so this guy comes in, and he kind of started talking to our bus driver. And then um, just in my heart, I heard... I need to tell him something about his daughter. And I was like, okay. And he actually was about to walk out. And then our bus driver kind of saw me looking at him. And then Juan like motioned to the guy like, hey, come here. This guy wants to talk to you. And so I end up getting up and I go and talk to him. And I said, hey, you know, I was, a, I was just, I just felt like I heard something about your daughter. I don't know what it is, but I just feel like I need to pray for you. And so I start praying for him and he just starts bawling like, hard and I'm like okay it really was something about his daughter so I've just prayed for him and then and then I asked hey have you eaten anything and he's like oh not really so I, we had some food and we gave him some food and I just sat down with him he was like hey I would like to sit and talk with you and tell you what happened I'm like okay and so he's like my daughter got really sick over the last few days um, she was a teenager I believe she's really sick she's been struggling a lot he's like today when I was leaving the house I just prayed and asked God for a sign that she's going to be okay. I'm just like, oh my, I'm just like undone. I'm like, God, you are so good, you know. So we may not know the full extent of what we're doing, but just being obedient, being like, all right, I'm going to tell that guy his daughter's going to be all right. And so I just, yeah, I just felt it to share because God really can use us in those ways if we're just willing and available. We don't have to be anything special, just available and willing. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So how many of you know this is for us? How many of you are like, I'm diving in. I'm diving in. I'm going all the way. You know, I like to say this. Um, you know, you ever watch different people get into the swimming pools or the lake? You ever watch them? How many of you ever seen the toe tippers? Or the toe dippers? Ooh, brr. Not, not. And then you've seen the, the slow walkers into the beach. Is that you, Colleen? Okay. How many cannonballers do we have? <laughs> Run and jump. Just, here's my point. I don't care how you get in. You can be a toe dipper. You can do the slow walk in. Or you can be a cannonballer. I don't care. Just get in. Amen. And you know what? God needs all kinds. He needs all of us in our, unique, our uniquenesses and our personalities. Sometimes my personality would run people away. But somebody else's personality will just attract them. Amen? You're here. How many of you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ already? You are born again. You know you're born again. You know you're saved. Uh, for those of you that are visiting, I'm not trying to pick on you. We just do this every Sunday. Because there's nothing more important than that personal relationship with Christ. Amen? Can I get folks that are a part of the prayer team, prayers to come on up? Hallelujah. This, when this happens, we're getting way close to the end of the service. You know? We're going to give an invitation for people to come and to, to receive Christ. And I would like to throw this in this invitation. If you would say, Pastor, I'm one of those, I'm getting all in. If you want to come up here and just say, would you pray with me that I get all in and that I'm used the way God wants to use me? If you want to come up for that reason, come up for that reason. I think it's perfect just to have prayer that's in line with what the message was. And then, you need healing in your body? God's still healing people today. If you're not born again and you want to receive Christ, come on up. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, come on up. You can get filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're in the middle of a mess and you just need someone to stand with you, come on up. Amen. Hallelujah. Charity, you got some. Um, I just have a word of knowledge for somebody who is, you have pain in your, what is this, right side here, in your right area here in your, I don't know, pain in here. And then also pain, somebody else 
when you walk, you get pain in your left here, whatever that is, the side. Um, you get pain there. And sometimes it comes and goes, but it feels like, especially when you're walking and you're walking a lot, it just, it just happens. And maybe even yesterday when you were walking, it happened yesterday when you were walking and it was just really painful for you yesterday. I would love to pray with you. Okay. So for those of you that say, well, that's me, don't miss out. Come on up here and get prayed for. But for any of those things, you guys, that word of knowledge, healing just in general, wisdom, direction, come to know Jesus Christ, I want to be used by God in, in the harvest that's about to take place. I want to be a harvester. Amen? So I'm going to say a closing prayer, but that doesn't mean church is done. That just means we're shifting gears. You can come on up for prayer. You can stand and worship for a while. You can go out and fellowship and enjoy some of them caramel rolls and good conversation with people. Amen. Heavenly Father, right now in Jesus' name, thank you for our time this morning. Most of all, God, thank you that we get to be with you. We get to be with you in your presence. We thank you that, Jesus, you took everything away. You took everything away. Our sin came in contact with that blood, and whoosh, is washed away. Shame gone. The gift of righteousness given. Abundance of grace poured out. Thank you. Thank you. And Father, if there's anyone in this building that has not said yes to Jesus, Holy Spirit, would you speak to their heart and say, yeah, today's your day. Go on up. Go on up there and say yes to Jesus. Hallelujah. You need healing in your body? Come on. You want hands laid on you to more accurately walk out what God has for you so it's soul winning? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And God, well, we continue to minister and pray for people up here up front. I thank you that Jesus... You never leave us nor forsake us, but you're with us always, even to the end of the age. And as we start to shift and go in different directions, thank you for walking with us. It's in your name, Jesus, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah.